Hi everyone, I'm Macy Whiten, Promotions Director for 88.1 Indie. Today on Media North Texas, we have the pleasure of interviewing the multi-talented Oliver Tree. He is redefining the music industry and pop culture scene once again with his album tour for Alone in a Crowd. With his U.S. tour starting January 13th, he'll be performing live in Dallas at the Southside Ballroom on February 4th. Following me is our podcast director, Ethan Leach, with the interview. Hi, I'm Ethan Leach, the podcast director at 88.1 Indie. Um, thank you for joining us. Oliver, would you like to introduce yourself to our Dallas-Fort Worth audience? Hi, my name is Oliver Tree. Um, I'm a world-renowned belly dancer. Um, I also dabble in music and film directing, but that's more of a part-time gig. Day job is full-time belly dancer. Yeah, big respect, big respect. You know, more people need to know about the profession. It needs to get out there. Um, anyway... Not to cause you any anxiety or anything, but at the time of this interview, your tour starts tomorrow. How are you feeling about this tour? Feeling good. I've had the chance to take it from Bali, Indonesia, through Australia, and through uh, Europe and the UK. So it's very well oiled. The machine is uh, alive and well. I've really, I've perfected the show, so it's ready to go. I'm excited to take this back to the motherland back to the states and uh back to my hometown in dallas a lot of people don't know this but i actually grew up there i, would, I lived there till i was six and um it's going to be a special hometown show i cannot wait wow that's exciting so you know including miss you from this album you have two billboard top 100 hits including life goes on you know everyone knows the uh <laughs> Everyone knows the meme, but, um, and also based on your Spotify charts, Miss You had 424 million streams in November last year alone. Um, and just like after all of this, how do you feel? What was your biggest I've made it moment? I don't know. For me, I don't really feel like I ever really made it. I think that the competitive nature of the music industry kind of leaves you always feeling like it's never enough, which for me as an artist, I've. I feel very satisfied. I'm not uh, feeling like it's not enough, but that being said, there's such a competitive side of the major labels and um, it makes it feel like, oh, you're always failing unless you're in the top 0.00001%. And somehow I've made it into the top 1%. But, you know, the way that it's built, the way that the machine is built, um, they kind of just leave you feeling like you haven't really ever made it. So with that being said, uh, Creatively speaking, artistically speaking, I feel very fulfilled and very satisfied, although career-wise, it feels like I haven't even put a dent into what I'm hoping to do. But, uh, you know, even if I didn't get further, I would be able to say, wow, I'm stoked that I even was able to do a fraction of what I've pulled off so far, especially with this haircut looking like this. it's a, It's been a Christmas miracle. Yeah. I mean, we we have plenty of time for you to go even further. So I, I really have big hopes and I'm I, I'm a really big fan. I've been a really big fan for a long time. I remember listening to um, It Was Ugly Is Beautiful when my sister was driving me to high school. Wow. Yeah. Um, That's crazy. But, you know, focusing on how you're speaking about creatively and artistically, you're feeling fulfilled right now. Your history as an artist, you incorporate a lot of different genres and a lot of different themes into your music. Who are some of your, who or what are some of your greatest inspirations and how they think, influenced your music? Yeah, I think the the biggest one for the Oliver Tree music project has been the Gorillaz. Um, I grew up listening to a lot of different styles of music and the Gorillaz were very inspiring in the way that they blend together so many genres. Um and made a mixed media project. So I think sonically, they're probably the easiest thing to look back at and say, okay, that was a big influence of trying to mix together rapping, singing, pop, uh, hip hop, dance music, um, electronic music. Uh, but yeah, for me, that would probably be sonically the biggest influence. And then from a film uh, direction side of things because for me so much of my work is as a visual artist and as a director so people like Wes Anderson um, Quentin Tarantino 
uh, people like Jim Carrey on a persona side, people like Andy Kaufman from a performance artist side, as well as Nathan Fielder and Sasha Barakow. And for me, uh, art isn't just, you know, one thing. It's really 360, and it's about the mixture of where art and entertainment uh, coincide. Because for me as an artist, my job is, you know, essentially 90% of it's marketing and 10% of it is the actual art, which is very sad to say out loud. But that's the sad reality of the modern day, you know, to make you have to make a lot of noise just to get your art to be seen. So obviously the art is the centerpiece, but without the promotion, it just goes unheard and unappreciated and unimpacting. So for me, so much of my art has been as a performance artist and provocateur and marketing meme essentially, and using memes as a medium to promote music and things that really have nothing to do with, um, you know, it's like you have to make, these other vehicles to pull people to the music. So I've used my image and I've used uh, comedy and other things to promote what is pretty much super serious from the heart music. But I, I just try to use everything I have as an artist, uh, as a human, really, to be able to neatly put it in a package and put a bow on top of it and present it to the world so that it can be somewhat unique and stand out uh, because it's hard to do in this modern climate. Wow, that is so amazing. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's the thing. There's so much incredible art out there, but it's so hard to get anyone to even pay attention or listen to it. So it's kind of an uphill battle right now. And the way that the major label system is set up is that, I mean, in all labels really is that no one can do much for you now. It's the artist's job to not only be the creator, uh, hopefully the creator, some people don't even write their own lyrics or make their own music, which that's another conversation for another time. Uh, but for me, I take a lot of pride in the fact that I write every lyric and melody and produce the music and play. Like for this album, I played 80% of the instruments. So that's like what you think is the job of the artist. But then really now the job of the artist is to be a marketing company, to be pretty much full on promotional entertainer. And it's always been entertainment business, but now more than ever is you know, the artist is expected to carry all the weight on the marketing side, which is just sheer ridiculousness. It takes so much time away from the actual goal of making and creating the art. So it's been creating a pretty weird state for art, if you will. Yeah, we definitely understand. One of the things that we're really cognizant of here at 88.1 is that it's not the sheer amount of resources that you have or the quality of them, it's how you use them, right? Um, so speaking of that, going back to 2020 for your um, unofficial official music video for Bury Me Alive, um, it was made on a $6 budget. And here at 88.1 Indie, we have a special called Homebrewed, um, where local bands can submit their music to be featured on the station. So we were wondering if you have any advice for up and coming artists, hoping to grow their career and, you know, reach a larger audience with maybe a smaller amount of resources or resources that aren't as high in production quality. Yeah, I think the first thing you have to do is just get your hands dirty. If you really are about something, you're just going to do it because you love to do it and you're going to do it because you have to do it. You're not going to need uh, to do it because people are going to be able to see it because people are going to be able to pay for it. You're just going to do it because you would be doing that thing, whether the whole world heard it or whether you were the only person in the entire universe, or maybe even just your friends are the ones to hear it. So it comes from a necessity of creation at the core. And if you find something you really love, the goal is to just try to do it at the highest level as possible. And uh, failure is a key part of that. It's a key component. Without failure, there is no success. We're pretty much mainly, we're remembered by our successes, not our failures, unless our failures were so monumental that someone was hurt. Realistically, a failure is something that didn't even make it into the, the consciousness, you know, we're remembered by the things that do, which are the successes. So realistically, um, failure is key. You're going to have to fail more times than you could ever imagine. For me, I feel like I've failed pretty much most of my career. And there's been a couple moments, like you mentioned, where it gets into a billboard 
top 30 or something like that. And that's when I feel like, oh, maybe I actually made something that connected. Like if it, if a song went platinum, then maybe that, if it sold a million copies worth equivalent, maybe that would be considered something that was a success. But I don't use the term success lightly. I only use it when I say the word success is like life changing success. The word failure for me is pretty much everything else. And that makes it so that failure isn't a negative word. I don't see failure as a negative word. It's it's actually the main part of success. So be prepared to fail more than you could ever imagine. And uh, pretty much most of it is failing and you're taking swings at uh, shooting arrows in the dark. And yeah, hopefully, you know, it's a, it's a numbers game too. The more you put out eventually something We'll have a more high odds of connecting. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't get too caught up over perfection because it doesn't exist. Yeah, you miss one hundred percent of the shots that you don't take. But um, back to back to your upcoming performance here in Dallas. How do you feel about performing at the largest performance stage in Dallas, Southside Ballroom? I'm excited. Um, it's going to be a really special show. I've been working on this show for five years. Um, I've invested over $5 million into this show. I wrote a screenplay for it that took a while for me to write. Uh, it's like 45 page screenplay. So it's a mixture of a concert at the centerpiece mixed with the movie, mixed with the TV show, mixed with elements of Broadway musical play, mixed with 360 entertainment. So you have stand up comedy, motivational speaking, scooter stunts, WWE wrestling, karate, even a couple belly dance moves thrown in there. So that's on the, the performance side. And then sonically, you get a mixture of pop music, uh, indie rock, uh, hip hop, electronic dance music, some folk, a little bit of uh, my take on country music. So, I mean, it, it, it's a span of 360, something for everyone. Um, but I'm very proud of this this project. And it's been a long time coming. And I've had to trick people into giving me a lot of funding for this. That was the worst investment loan type of money. Like, you know, I have to make back $8 to pay back $1. So oh, I'm going to be paying back the, the money for the show for the rest of my life probably. But instead of buying a home, I don't live anywhere. I don't rent a home. I don't own a home. I put this, all the money that I ever had into this show. So it's essentially my house. Wow. Well, I mean, you don't have to worry about paying mortgages. So yeah. Keeps but, it easy. Um, yeah. I, so much time, so many resources invested into this and you always have a fresh new narrative for each musical experience you create and your performances are still always described as electrifying. How do you, how do you plan ahead to make it happen? Um, for me, it's like you let the art be what it needs to be. And then you kind of write it in reverse and figure out how to reverse engineer it. And for me, each time it's like, it's a mixture of resources, uh, how much funding, what are my limitations working within the parameters of limitations. And then also working with the parameters of technology. Like I have versions of where I want to take the show, but the technology is not really there yet. So I know where it's going to go in five years. Once the AI fully is at the next level that I can do certain things I'm not going to speak on, but essentially you're working with parameters and that's kind of what makes art. What it is, is that there's an endless plethora of room for possibilities, but the limitations make it what it actually is. And working within those parameters is really what uh, becomes your best friend instead of it being your worst enemy you have to embrace those parameters and, and work within them and yeah for me it's about keeping it fresh for myself and excited and for example i've been working on this show for five years and i'm already like i'm so excited about that show but i'm also been working on my next show like i'm i'm currently editing in between interviews today like i just topped off the phone with the white house i just did a meeting with them and in between that and this interview i'm editing together the visuals for my next show which is called dr oliver tree it's a dj project and it's an hour and a half i've been working on that for over a year and it's a labor of love like the most next level what i consider the most next level mixture of dj meets um all my favorite cinema all edited down to you know thousands of hours of work put into the show by just myself um so i'm very proud of that so i'm just 
keep it fresh for myself. And, and even if I maybe kind of burnt out on the show that I've made as far as from a creation standpoint, I don't need to do more with that. That show that I'm going to play in Dallas is going to be the show I play for years because I've invested so much time, but I'm already on to the next thing. So you got to also watch yourself and not get too far ahead of the curve. But yeah, I'm, I'm already about to start on this tour doing some DJ sets. So I'm prepping, getting ready for this audio visual Dr. Oliver Tree experience. That's a, a whole new project to keep myself excited by doing new stuff. You said you couldn't spill any secrets about it, but uh, what a shame. Too early to spill secrets. Um, can you speak to how your performances have evolved over time? Um, yeah, I think for me, I obviously had a lot of limitations early on with, uh, you know, touring is very expensive. And for example, it still makes it very hard for me to be able to do everything I want to do. So I'm working within the parameters, as I mentioned before, but now I have a lot more funding than I had when I started from a performance standpoint. So now I can afford to have a semi truck and a tour bus. I can bring props like six foot tall guitars and cows that I can surf on. And I can bring in, you know, do three or four outfit changes within the show so that I can be able to bring a uh, much higher production value. But that being said, I still can't afford to do the full stage sets that I want to do and build out, you know, the, a lot of the different components. But with that being said, the, I kind of have been working on a similar show over the course of the last five or six years. Um, but now I've really put it on steroids and evolved the visual component and made it a mixture of this movie um, with also the concert. Speaking of evolving performances and these things that you're now able to do, back to 2020 again, jumping back and forth, you know, um, largest kick scooter, right? For Ugly is Beautiful. What is, in that vein, what is one of the most recent unique skills that you've acquired just for performances, for stunts, for videos? Because I know you said you're always like keeping it fresh, but what it, what is one thing that is like close to your heart that you've really been working on, especially for, you know, that DJ project? Right. Um, yeah, to answer that, for people who are listening and don't know, what you're referring to is um, I built the world's biggest scooter, which is a kick scooter, which is essentially like a razor scooter, uh, but it's 15 feet tall. So I broke the Guinness World Book of Records for that. But not only did I build it, I crashed it as well. Um, and then recently I actually got arrested for driving it through traffic in Los Angeles um, about four months ago. Um so that was something that was a dream of mine for many years. And I finally was able to trick people into giving me some money to do it. Um, recently, I think this year, one thing I really spent a lot of time on was pogo sticking. Um, I have a background in action sports. I used to be a professional scooter rider. Um, and this year I spent some time pogo sticking and I learned how to do backflips on pogo sticks. Um, and you could see that in my one and only music video for this new album alone in a crowd. Uh, I went to Serbia for three months, lived out there. And before that I was training for about six months, learning how to pogo stick and do flips on pogo sticks. And that would probably be one of the, the main new skills I've acquired. DJing isn't a new one. I actually, the last show I DJed was when I was 17 in high school. I opened up for Skrillex and then I didn't play a show for 13 years. And I returned to play my first set back as Dr. Oliver Tree uh, in Antarctica a couple weeks ago. So that was pretty epic to return back uh, in such a crazy place. Antarctica kind of hits hard right now. It's like freezing down here. It's, it's literally below freezing until right after this interview ends. Wow. We are, we are not built for this. We're all freezing in here. <laughs> but it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Um, but, you know, between this tour and your last tour, Cowboy Tears, um, what has, have you noticed anything that has, like, there, there's been a big change in your persona as an artist? Yeah. I mean, the difference between the shows is this one has led screens and a huge visual component the last show i did was more built around a stage set and 
props and now I've taken the props, lost the stage set and put all the money into way, 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 way more money into creating this visual audio experience. As far as persona goes, I've included a new character and have outfit changes so I can include the first album's character from Ugly is Beautiful, which is name is Turbo. The second album, Shawnee Bravo, which is the cowboy character. And then this new character, Cornelius Cummings, who's a fashion designer. So I have all three of them put together in this new show and you get to kind of see how they're all from different timelines, the same kind of dude who's had this accident where he hit his head and you kind of see how they all, all the narratives of all, you could call it the Oliverse, um, <laughs> which is the universe of Oliver Tree, how they all connect and connecting the dots in a way that's very meta and statements on commercialism. And uh, I get to make it uh, something that I don't think has ever been made before. So I'm pretty, pretty excited. I've taken the idea of a concert and kind of taken it somewhere else, which I'm very proud of. Wow. So for Alone and Crowd, um, especially on social media, for that visual experience, you posted... I saw it first on, it was Twitter, and you described the experience as concert, movie, TV show, Broadway show, and you touched on this multiple times in the interview, but when you were first starting, I know you've been working on this for a long time, when you were first starting with this concept, what was, what was the hardest element to incorporate? I think for me, the hardest thing to incorporate was how to find a through line between all of the the different music videos and how to connect the dots in the whole world of it and how to make it so that I could have it come to life and feel like one full movie without it being too disconjointed um, and not knowing if really this could work, how it would translate live because – you're taking a gamble when you, whenever you try to do something outside of the norm in the box. So there was no guarantee that this would make sense or work. And we didn't even have time to do a proper dress rehearsal. The first show we played was at Red Rocks um, for like 8,000 people. And we had never even really run through the full show. We were bouncing out visuals uh, 20 minutes before we went on stage, which is a horrible decision to make, but we were just working on it till the last minute to try to make it everything it could be. And after that show, I was like, holy crap, this actually really does work. And the more I played it, the more I was like, financially, this doesn't make any sense. Like I'm, I just toured for the last few months, barely even broke even. I'm not even sure I broke even. And even with this US tour, I will be basically breaking even essentially with how much I've invested into it, let alone all the money and the visuals. That's not even considered breaking even with that. But just in general, I'm barely breaking even just on the production costs. Um, so it's not really, it doesn't make any sense to do a show at this scale, especially not without it being at arenas or the bigger step up. Um, but that being said, I want to make something really special. And if that means, you know, an investment and, and breaking even, then that's what it's going to be. I always want to just put on something really special that hopefully people can talk about the next day, talk about the next week. Some people hopefully talk about it months later, even years later. I'm hoping that some people will see the show and tell their grandkids about it. So you're, you're talking about, you know, performing in arenas and stuff. Um, did you know that uh, Southside Ballroom, it started as an opera house? Um, and just sort of, you know, as it relates to you bringing so many elements together, both visual and audio, um, it's been a movie theater, basketball court, <laughs> it's been a boxing venue. Um, wow. so it's really, it's really on point with that. It's even been a church, a church hall wow. um, and a concert hall for, for gospel choir. I love this. Well, it sounds like the perfect venue for me to be able to play this show, especially for my WWE wrestling component. I'm going to channel in some of those boxers who have uh, fought and lost and won at this beautiful venue. I'm excited, man. I'm really pumped. Yeah. If you ever need someone to like demonstrate on, you can just like grab someone from like the crowd and like body slam them on stage. I've done that before. There was a concert I performed at, uh, it was a private event and um, someone came on stage and I had five hours of prosthetics 
prosthetic face, prosthetic mohawk, yeah. a full prosthetic body. And this person seemed to think it would be a good idea to climb on the stage where there was no security at a private event, try to put their hat on me. I put them in a full Nelson, choke slammed them, <laughs> started doing body burial, smashing them in. And uh, the footage leaked out to TMZ. It was actually uh, my lawyer, Jeremiah Jeffrey, was uh, not too happy. But if you look up this footage on TMZ that I fought, I fought this fan claimed alleged fan and uh one thing in the comment section people said this guy beat up his only fan which i thought that was amazing um so that's all the time we have for this interview um Sweet. thank you so much i appreciate your questions your time and uh hope you can make it to the show it's going to be a special one i i will definitely try i'm trying my hardest i'm trying my hardest but um yeah. thank you so much for joining us here's our promotion director macy whiten Oliver, thank you so much for the opportunity. Also wanted to say I'm a huge fan of the H3 podcast, but I think all of the Oliver 3 episodes are by far the best ones. Oh, I'm I'm going to call in on the H3 podcast today, so I'm going to try to take over, do a little takeover, see if he lets me, but the guy's a clown. (laughs) All right, have a good one. You have a good day, too. Appreciate it. Peace. Thank you so much for joining us, and a huge thank you again to Oliver Tree. For more information about his upcoming tour and ticket availability, you can check out the link in the description below. You can also find him online through his social media handles listed above. For more 88.1 Indie content, check out our Instagram, Facebook, and X, formerly Twitter.